In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy divine love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Ghost hath instructed the hearts of thy faithful, grant us by the same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O sorrowful and immaculate heart of Mary, Saint Joseph, Saint John Nepomucene, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We come now to the sacrament of confession. And in the prayer, we invoke the great Saint John Nepomucene. Saint John Nepomucene is often pictured with his finger before his mouth. And he has a Beretta. And uh, the Duke of Bohemia, when he lived, I think it was the 1400s, the Duke demanded of him to reveal the, the Duchess's confession. And the Duchess went to confession to St. John Nepomucene, and he refused to reveal, obviously, what she confessed because of the seal of confession. He was threatened, he was bribed and finally threatened with death. St. John Nepomucene, this good holy priest, he refused to break the seal of confession. They tied his hands and feet and threw him over the bridge in, into the deep river, and he drowned. He's a martyr of the seal of confession. So, confession. What is this great sacrament worth dying for by a priest, a holy priest? It's defined in our catechism as confession is the telling of our sins to an authorized priest for the purpose of obtaining forgiveness. An authorized priest is one who has not only the power to forgive sins by reason of his ordination to the priesthood, but also the power of jurisdiction over the persons whom come to him. He has this jurisdiction ordinarily from his bishop and by reason of his office. And then we have Psalm 31. I have confessed my sin to thee, and my fault I have not concealed. I said, I confess my iniquity to the Lord. 
and thou didst forgive the guilt of my sin. And then Proverbs chapter 28, <clears throat> verse 13, He that hideth his sins shall not prosper, but he that shall confess and forsake them shall obtain mercy. And then the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 19, verse 17, And this became known to all the Jews and Gentiles living in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus came to be held in high honor. And many of those who believed kept coming and openly confessed their practices. So a priest has to have the jurisdiction. In normal times, in a diocese, the Pope gives the power to the bishops, the bishops have a power over their diocese, and the, pre, the, di the bishops give the power to the priests over certain parishes to hear confessions. That's the normal routine before Vatican II. Uh, after Vatican II, in the state of emergency, since the whole Catholic faith is threatened by modernism, by the heresies of Vatican II and the New Mass, we're in an emergency survival operation until Rome returns to Catholic tradition. This is why Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated four bishops in 1988. It was Operation Survival. And he said, had I made an agreement with Rome, it would have been the finishing, the end, the extinguishing of Catholic tradition. So now, as, as long as we're in this state of emergency, does a, fa a father and husband, does he really break the law when he drives through a red light at 3 in the morning to get his wife, who's, who's about to deliver with the baby, to the midwife or to the hospital? Yeah, he breaks the law, but it's justified breaking of the law for a higher reason, which is the urgency of the birth, as long as he drives carefully while looking out for traffic. So too, in the state of emergency, any traditional Catholic priest can hear confessions to those who come and ask, and the church herself provides the jurisdiction. This is what's called supplied jurisdiction for our marriages, for our confessions. And many of our enemies, St. Peter's, Institute of Christ the King, and um, uh, many of these liberal groups, they attack Archbishop Lefebvre and the priests of the society, at least before 2012, they always attack, which was, oh, you don't have jurisdiction from the bishop. You don't have jurisdiction from the bishop. You're not regularized. And no society, no traditional priest of real tradition who rejects Vatican II and the New Mass is regularized. They are persecuted by the modernist bishops and popes of Vatican II. We're persecuted. So in this state of emergency, the church gives us the full jurisdiction to hear confession to any who ask. And that's common sense. That shows the charity of the Holy Ghost and epikeia, it's called a Greek word, where the mind of the lawgiver is interpreted in these particular cases. The mind of the lawgiver, the lawgiver is Christ, his sacred heart, and giving the law to his church to save souls. And in this emergency crisis, the, the, the mind of Christ is to forgive sins. And when the bishops try to persecute Catholic tradition, persecute Catholic priests of tradition by kicking them out to the streets, depriving them of the so-called regularization and jurisdiction to hear confessions. And the only option the people have is go to these modernist priests who tell them that certain sins are not sins, who prepare them badly for marriage. Then you're in an emergency situation. And the church herself supplies the jurisdiction. Very simply put, and it's very foolish for our enemies who have betrayed Catholic tradition by keeping the Latin Mass, pretending to be Catholic priests of tradition, but except Vatican II and the New Mass. Say what you want, it's a betrayal. Oh, but he says Mass devoutly. All right, but it's still a betrayal. But he gives good sermons. Well, blessed be God if he speaks what's true. But still, if he openly accepts Vatican II in the New Mass, or belongs to a group that does, they are betraying the faith. So to all these good priests, 
who belong, say, to St. Peter's Institute of Christ the King, the new SSPX, you have a duty to come, really, to tradition and abandon the lie of accepting Vatican II and the new Mass and help support the rebuilding of the Catholic Church. And there's plenty of room here for priests to come who want to fight on the front lines to defend tradition here at Our Lady Mount Carmel Seminary in Boston, Kentucky. Come, I dare you. Come and stand up for our Lord and come and defend the faith the way you're ordained and supposed to by your ordination. And stop betraying our Lord and running away from the real fight that you're supposed to do. And that goes for all of us. And we're all going to be judged, especially priests, on uh, their duty towards our Lord and how faithful we are to him and obedient to him and his Catholic tradition and his magisterium. And it's a sin to obey orders that go against Catholic tradition and the holy faith and morals. So confession, then, is so powerful, and we must confess our sins. Why must we confess our sins? Many Protestants have a problem with this. Oh, I go straight to God. But St. John Bosco says God didn't lay that down as a condition. He did in an emergency situation. He did, if you cannot get to a priest, you can go directly to God and make a perfect act of contrition. But the normal way is the sacrament of confession. And St. John Bosco's example is this. God could have made it that when you cast the corn seeds into the field, in one hour you got full field of good corn, ripe and ready to eat. But God didn't do it that way. The conditions God set was you got to prepare the field. You got to uh, uh, turn the field. You got to clear the weeds. You got to fertilize it, then plant the seed, and then you're not done. You got to make sure it's plentifully rained or watered or irrigated. And then only after many months, all summer long, do you start seeing the crop rise. And only in the, in the late August or fall do you get a good crop. So that's how it works. And for us to have our sins forgiven, the normal route is kneel down to a priest and go to confession. And when we do that, we go to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, who through the priest forgives our sins. So let's go into the, some of these questions, why this is so important. Why must we confess our sins? First, we must confess our sins because Jesus Christ himself, obliges us to do so in these words spoken to the apostles and to the successors in the priesthood. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. And whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. That's in St. John chapter 20 or 21, one of those chapters. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. How do these words of Christ oblige us to confess our sins? These words of Christ oblige us to confess our sins because the priest cannot know whether he should forgive or retain our sins unless we tell them to him. So the priest, like a judge, has to hear the evidence. And the evidence is telling our sins in the seal of confession. Then the priest can judge. He's really sorry, and he deserves to be forgiven. And in most cases, that's the case. They are sorry. In very few cases, they are not sorry. And they're not resolved to avoid the proximate occasion of sin. The priest must judge the penitent in order to act as judge the priest must know whether to forgive or to retain, that is, not forgive, the penitent's sins. It would be impossible for the priest to decide, that is, to judge whether or not the penitent should be forgiven, unless the penitent made known the extent of his guilt and his sorrow. Next point. In the sacrament of penance, the priest also acts as the physician or doctor of the soul. He tells the penitent how to avoid sin, and how to amend his life. Just as we tell a doctor about our bodily aches and pains, in order that he can cure us, so also we tell our sins to the priest, in order that he can suggest spiritual remedies. So the priest will give advice to help 
curb the sin, how to fight the sin, how to avoid occasions of sin. Next point, since God has commanded us to confess our sins to the priest as his representative, we should not let shame prevent us from doing so. The priest as God's representative will advise and encourage us, help us solve our doubts, guide our future conduct, and forgive our sins in the name of Christ. He will never under any circumstance, not even to save his own life, make our sins known to anyone else. Priests, bishops, and even the Pope must also confess their sins to a priest. So the priest is a father in confession, and he really guides the souls. And, it's a, it's, and this is one of the reasons it's such a beautiful sacrament, because the priest guides the soul, and some of them are, are being choked by the devil, by despair, by misunderstanding, by, by a cloud of confusion. And to confess our sins is one of the best remedies to heal our pride, self-delusion, and many other problems that come from sin. So, and then, of course, the grace of the precious blood of Jesus heals the wounds of sin. Is it necessary to confess every sin? Is it necessary to confess every sin? It is necessary to confess every mortal sin which has not yet been confessed and forgiven. It is not necessary to confess our venial sins, but it is better to do so. So all mortal sins must be confessed and all their numbers as best as we can remember. So if there's a, let's just say, a habit of sin, then we say how many times a month, how many times a week, how many times a day, for example. First point, it is not necessary to confess venial sins because they do not deprive the soul of sanctifying grace. And as, you, as I repeat, the church teaches, one Our Father, one act of contrition, forgives all venial sins. St. Thomas Aquinas says, to receive our Lord in communion just burns off all venial sins. And depending on the love with which we receive our Lord, it burns off also purgatory time. That is, temporal punishment due to sin. Next point, it is better to confess our venial sins, because when we do so, we have more assurance that they are forgiven, and because we, we receive from the sacrament of penance special graces, to help us avoid them in the future. What are the chief qualities of a good confession? The chief qualities of a conf good confession are three. It must be humble, sincere, and tire. Firstly, what does it mean that our confession be humble? Our confession is humble when we accuse ourselves of our sins with a conviction of guilt for having offended God. And that's why in the sacrament of confession, we often say, my last confession was whatever, however time ago, a week ago, and these are my sins. I accuse myself of lying five times. I accuse myself of stealing a bank three times. I steal myself of, of um, whatever so many times. I accuse myself. And that's a humble way of confessing and very truthful. Our Lord's own words, St. Luke chapter 15, verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. And this is how we speak to our Lord in the sacrament of confession. St. Luke chapter 18, verse 13. O God, be merciful to me, the sinner. So this humbling towards God is, is most pleasing to God. Because a humble, the prayer of the humble man, says St. James, pierces the clouds, while the proud God rejects. And going to confession frequently humbles us, keeps us in reality, avoids, again, self-delusion, to think we're all that great. When we have to confess our sin, we realize that I'm not all that great. In fact, I'm poor and I'm miserable and I need God's help and his grace. 
When is our, sacri our confession sincere? When is it sincere? It is sincere when we tell our sins honestly and frankly, without trying to hide, trying to excuse. First point, we must manifest our humility and sincerity in confession by telling our sins clearly and distinctly so that the priest can understand them. So, for example, I accuse myself of bad thoughts. Well, you got to be a little more precise. Bad thoughts to kill your sister, your wife. Bad thoughts to steal. Bad thoughts to strangle somebody. Bad thoughts to blaspheme God. What bad thoughts do you mean? Or impurity? you got to be precise. Next point. Persons who lack the power of speech may, if they wish, write a list of their sins for the priest. So this does happen. They write down their sin. The priest sees it, and he writes down their penance. Persons who are hard of hearing should confess in places set aside for them so that neither they nor the priest will be overheard. And this also, in the old days, sometimes there were priests hard of hearing. <laughs> and people would be lined up outside, and the priest would say, What you say? Speak louder! And the poor penitent has to shout his sins, and the whole church is hearing their confession. So in those cases, you got to tell the, you know, if the priest isn't aware, something's going to have to be done with that, right? But uh, these things happen in the history of the church. So our sins need to be sincere, humble, sincere, and then entire. Our confession is entire. When... We confess at least all our mortal sins, telling their kind, murder, lust, blasphemy, stealing, telling their kind the number of times we have committed each sin and any circumstances changing their nature. So what is meant by the kind of sins? It is meant the class to which they belong, such as blasphemy, missing mass, without a serious reason, disobedience, theft, the best way to determine the different kinds of sin is to determine the virtue that has been violated or the commandment that has been broken. We must confess whether the sin was in thought, word, or action. Because there is a difference between these three things. Thoughts, words, actions. In most prayer books, there are lists of sins which help us to determine the kinds of sins we have committed. These are called examinations of conscience. They're often in the Missal. You can find them, I think, online, a good examination of conscience and to prepare a good confession. What are the circumstances that change the nature of sin? They are those which add some new kind of wickedness to the act that we have done. For example, if a person kills another, he commits a sin of murder. But the killing of a priest or a nun consecrated to God is a circumstance that adds a new wickedness to his act and makes it also a sin of sacrilege. So again, if I steal $20 from a rich man, that's a sin. In that case, it's a venial sin. But if I steal $20 from a very poor, destitute man who needs that to survive for the next few days, I commit a mortal sin because the circumstances change the nature. You see, he's a beggar, or the rich man is not so dependent on that $20. We have the books of Scripture, Numbers chapter 5, verse 5. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say to the children of Israel, When a man or woman shall have committed any of all the sins that men are wont to commit, and by negligence shall have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and offended, they shall confess their sin. So even in the Old Testament, God demanded a certain kind of confession to the priests and certainly to God. What are we to do if, without our fault, we forget to confess a mortal sin? So this can happen when people, and I certainly encourage our hearers, to come on retreat. We have Ignatian retreats every year um, for women and men. 
usually in June and July, and then in September. And uh, normally you make a general confession of your whole life, or since your last confession. And sometimes people try to remember their sins, especially older people who are making general confessions of their life, and they realize a week or two later, oh, I forgot to confess such and such a mortal sin. Well, it is forgiven if they did not intend to, to hide it. They, they, didn't, they just completely forgot, honestly. Well, the Catechism says, it's forgiven, no worries. Just tell it in the next confession. It's really that simple. And sometimes the devil gets in there and he wants to agitate the soul. Oh, I made a bad confession. Oh, am I, am I really forgiven? Am I in mortal sin? No, you're not. Be at peace. St. Francis de Sales tells us, be at peace, because this is a, an agitation from the devil. Just tell it in your next confession, and you're fine. And it's already forgiven, because you were sorry for all your sins anyway. There are times when a person... Oh, here. If without our fault we forget to confess a mortal sin, we may receive Holy Communion, because we have made a good confession, and the sin is forgiven. But we must tell the sin in confession if it again comes to our mind. There are times when a person can receive the sacrament of penance without telling the nature and number of all his sins. A dying person, for example, of a large number of soldiers or a large number of soldiers going into battle may not have time for a detailed confession. Before receiving absolution, they must admit that they have sinned, that they are sorry, and that they want to be absolved. Those who have confessed in this general way must in their next confession tell all their sins according to their nature and number and circumstances that change their nature. So is this a torture of the mind? Okay, maybe. But that torture is a kind of purification also. And better be tortured here and confess our sins, honestly, than to be tortured forever in hell, right? So we got to be simple with God. And if I have the audacity and the boldness and the cruelty to crucify my God again by my sins, certainly mortal sin, then it's a good medicine for my pride to confess my sins. And that's why our Lord made this sacrament also, to humble our pride. To kneel down and confess our sin. It humbles the proud. What happens if we knowingly conceal a mortal sin in confession? If we knowingly conceal a mortal sin in confession, the sins we confess are not forgiven. Moreover, we commit a mortal sin of sacrilege. St. Alphonsus calls it a lie to the Holy Ghost. So deliberately to conceal a mortal sin in confession is a sacrilege because it is a grievous abuse of the sacrament of penance, a, a sacred institution of Christ. So what must a person do who has knowingly concealed a mortal sin in confession? What does he do? A person who has knowingly concealed a mortal sin in confession must confess that he has made a bad confession. Tell the sin he has concealed, mention the sacraments he has received since that time, and confess all the other mortal sins he has committed since his last good confession. So avoid all these problems. Just be simple. Confess our sins. There's no, there's no big deal to it. But the devil really is a cruel enemy, and he tries to make the person ashamed Listen to St. Alphonsus on some of these excuses. Let me read to you from St. Alphonsus' great sermons, which all of you should be aware of. He says this, St. Augustine says that to prevent the sheep from seeking assistance by her cries, the wolf seizes her by the neck and thus securely carries her away and devours the lamb. The devil acts in the same way with the sheep of our Lord Jesus Christ. After having induced them to yield to sin, he then bites them by the throat, that they may not confess their guilt, 
and thus he securely brings them to hell. For those who have sinned grievously, there is no means of salvation but the confession of their sins. And St. Anthony of Padua, in his many sermons, he talks about the importance of being freed from the devil's claws by good confessions. But what hope of salvation can he have who goes to confession and hides his sins and makes use of the tribunal of penance to offend God and to make himself doubly the slave of Satan? What hope would you entertain of the recovery of the man who, instead of taking the medicine prescribed by his doctor, drinks a cup of poison? What can the, what can the sacrament of penance be to those who hide their sins but a deadly poison which adds to their guilt the malice of sacrilege? In giving absolution, the confessor dispenses to his penitent the blood of Jesus Christ, for it is through the merits of that blood that he absolves from sin. What then does the sinner do when he conceals his sin in confession? He tramples underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. And should he afterwards receive Holy Communion in a state of sin, he is, according to St. John Chrysostom, as guilty as if he threw the consecrated host into a sewer. Accursed shame! How many poor souls do you bring to hell? Unhappy souls, they think only of the shame of confessing their sins and its embarrassment, and do not reflect that if they conceal them, they shall be certainly damned. So here's the list of excuses and questions some penitents bring up from St. Alphonsus. Here we go. Some penitents ask, what will my confessor say when he hears that I have committed such a sin? St. Alphonsus says, what will he say? He will say that you are, like all persons living on the earth, miserable and prone to sin. He will say that if you have done evil, you have also performed a glorious action in overcoming shame and in honestly confessing your sins. So in the eyes of the priest, it's an honorable and praiseworthy thing because he knows how hard that can be. But I'm afraid to confess this sin. St. Alphonsus, to how many confessors, I ask, must you tell your sins? It is enough to mention it to one priest who hears many sins of the same kind from others. It is enough to confess it once. A confessor will give you a penance and absolution, and your conscience shall be in peace. But, you say, I feel a great repugnance to tell this sin to my spiritual father. Tell it, then, says St. Alphonsus. Just spit it out to another confessor, and if you wish, to one to whom you are totally unknown. But if this come to the knowledge of my confessor, he will be displeased with me. What then do you mean to do? Perhaps to avoid giving displeasure to him, you intend to commit a heinous crime and remain under sentence of damnation. This would be the very height of folly. Are you afraid that the confessor will make known your sin to others? Would it not be madness to suspect that he is so wicked as to break the seal of confession by revealing your sin to others? Remember that the obligation of the seal of confession is so strict that a confessor cannot speak out of confession even to the penitent of the smallest venial fault, and if he did so without his permission, he would be guilty of a most grievous sin. So the seal of confession, now I remind you, remember the Protestants, they go on public radio, public internet interviews, and confess their sins to the world. And I can't confess my sins in the seal of confession and silence to one priest? St. Alphonsus continues, But you say I am afraid that my confessor, when he hears my sin, will rebuke me with great severity. St. Alphonsus, do you not see that all these are deceitful tricks of the devil to bring you to hell? No, the confessor will not rebuke you but he will give an advice suited to your state. 
A confessor cannot experience greater consolation and happiness than an absolving a penitent who confesses his sins with true sorrow and with sincerity. And this is true. It's one of the greatest joys of being a priest is to help poor souls break the chains of the devil that's dragging them to hell. If a queen were mortally wounded by a slave and you were in possession of a, great, of a remedy by which she could be cured, how great would be your joy in saving her life. Such is the joy which a confessor feels in absolving a soul in the state of sin. But his, by his act, he delivers the soul from eternal death, and by restoring to her the grace of God, he makes her a queen of paradise. So we should never be ashamed to confess all our mortal sins. And we really confess to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And as St. Saint, Saint John Chrysostom says, all our sins are going to be made known at the end of the world anyway. All of them. And if we've confessed them, it'll be to glorify God's mercy. If we don't confess them, it'll be to our shame and damnation in hell. So we don't play games with these great sacraments. And what does the priest give us as a penance? after confession. The priest gives us a, a penance after confession that we may make some atonement to God for our sins, receive help to avoid them in the future, and make some satisfaction for the temporal punishment due to sin. So remember, if the priest gives you a penance, say three Hail Marys, you have to do it in justice to God. You owe it. And if we don't do our penances here on earth, we're going to pay for it in purgatory. So we've got to do it on earth. It's a matter of justice. So if the priest gives you a penance, <coughs> let's say you have diabetes and you, have, you can't fast for long, and the priest tells you fast for two days, you've got to tell the priest, Father, I, I don't have the health to do that. Can you give me another penance? And he'll be happy to, no problem. Joel, the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 12. Now therefore, says the Lord, be converted to me with all your heart, in fasting, and in weeping, and in mourning. So, the satisfaction due to sins committed. What kind of punishments are due to sin? Two kinds of punishment are due to sin. Eternal punishment of hell, due to unforgiven mortal sins. And temporal punishment, lasting only for a time, due to venial sins and also to mortal sins after they have been forgiven. Christ, by his death on the cross, made more than adequate satisfaction to atone for all the temporal punishment due to all the sins of mankind. But God wants us also to perform works of penance ourselves in order to receive all the benefits of the satisfaction of Christ. So St. Paul will say, I fill up what is wanting to the sufferings of Christ. St. John chapter 15, And if, if anyone does not abide in me, he shall be cast outside as the branch and wither, and they shall gather them up and cast them into the fire, and they shall burn. So the punishment to mortal sin is eternal hell fire. And St. Alphonsus says, One mortal sin is that great, that serious that all the eternity of fire cannot sufficiently punish it. That's how serious sin is. So we want to really pray to be sorry and confess them. And remember to confess them brings a great peace to the soul and the absolution heals the wounds. And then the last couple questions. Does the sacrament of penance worthily received always take away all punishment? The sacrament of penance, worthily received, always takes away all eternal punishment. But it does not always take away all temporal punishment, which would be suffered in this life or in purgatory. The sacrament of penance, however, does not always take away all temporal punishment due to sins committed after baptism. 
The dispositions with which one receives the sacrament of penance determine the amount of temporal punish punishment which will be taken away. And that's why we want to beg from God perfect contrition. Because out of love for God, a perfect love of God could remit even all of our purgatory, or a huge chunk of it. Why does God require temporal punishment for sin? This troubles a lot of people. Why does God, why is he so mean as to demand punishment? Well, because God is God. And he's just, as well as merciful. God requires temporal punishment for sin to satisfy his justice, to teach us the great evil of sin, and to warn us not to sin again. And even in the, as, as bad as our world is now, a criminal still gets punished. Some, many of them are sentenced for life in prison, some with the death penalty. And even in, even in the military, there's a punishment for breaches against the law of the military. And even traffic violations have a punishment. So if the human order, the civil order, has punishment for transgressions and sins, how much more Almighty God who is perfect and, and just. So sin is not a joke. Yes, God is great and merciful, and His mercy exceeds His justice, but God is not also to be mocked. And that's, that's what our modern world does, is mock God by saying, well, I can sin, I can believe what I want and still go to heaven. That's not true. Where do we pay the debt of our temporal punishment? We pay the debt of our temporal punishment either in this life or in purgatory. Last question. What are the chief means of satisfying the debt of our temporal punishment besides the penance given in confession? Beside the penance imposed after confession, the chief means of satisfying the debt of our temporal punishment are prayer, attending mass, fasting, almsgiving, the works of mercy, the patient endurance of our daily sufferings, and indulgences. Tobias chapter 12, prayer is good with fasting and alms more than to lay up treasures of gold. For alms delivereth from death, and the same is that which purges away sins and makes to find mercy and life everlasting. So one thing very pleasing to God is prayer and giving charity to those in need, to the poor and to those who are especially are spiritually poor. Tell other people where they can hear good sermons on the internet, hear good catechisms, where they can follow Mass. And here at Our Lady Mount Carmel, every Sunday Mass is filmed live. And for many shut-ins all over the world, they can assist at Mass, send your guardian angel to Mass, make a spiritual communion. And you could receive far more grace than many people who come to the altar and come to Mass, but their minds are distracted and they really don't care to be there before God, and their hearts are far from Him. So our Lord sees all the hearts all over the world. And Padre Pio used to tell the people, send your guardian angel to Mass. And if you've been to Mass, send them anyway to get more grace. That concludes this catechism for now on confession. The next catechism we will study how to make a good confession. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. Saint Joseph, pray, pray for us. Saint John the pray, pray for us. Saint Anthony, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen.